I got August orders to do, and it hurts my soul to order comics now. Really? From previews. Come on and visit for any occasion. Don't keep patting down, waiting. Comics and conversation. Keep the conversation moving along. Keep bringing comics, keep your local store strong. If it's hard, then it's a job for the challenger. Comics and conversation, y'all. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Patrick Brower and W. Dal Bush. I'll tell you what, Dal. Mm-hmm. It was a legendary day today. I was waiting for it. Yeah. yeah. Good. I said it wrong, though. I said legendary. It should be legendary. But I wanted to hit the legend because sure. we sold a million Marvel Legends today. Yeah, they uh, we got in the um, the Avengers Infinity War Wave Two, which was the Call of Obsidian build a figure, and the uh, X-Men, he looks great by the way. Uh, wave, which was the uh, Marvel's Apocalypse build a figure. Wow, way to hit the Marvels in that. They put it right on the on the figure. It's not just Apocalypse; it's Marvel's Apocalypse. So we got four cases of X Men and two cases of Avengers. Yep. And at first, I thought this was just the effects of there not being a Toys R Us. Maybe a little bit, but mm, I think it has more to do with how poor Hasbro's toy distribution has been the last few months. Well, the reason I don't necessarily think it's the Toys R Us thing is that nobody cared about the Avengers wave. They just wanted the X-Men figures. Yeah, I mean, that's been a thing for a while. The X-Men waves are usually the ones that fans get way more excited about. And I, some of that is just a, a matter of the Avengers wave was half of the case was Ant-Man and Wasp. If you're not excited about the Ant-Man and Wasp movie enough to want to buy figures, half the case you don't care about. And the other half was Thor and Black Widow from the movie, and then Black Knight and Malekith. And I've noticed recently that for a, a few of the waves that have come out from Marvel Legends, that like the comics figures, which were the things that I would think most people at a comic shop would care about, kind of goes the other way. Yeah, but if you recall, for the last Thor wave, the mm-hmm. Ragnarok wave... Nobody wanted the movie figures. Well, I mean, eventually they did. Like the, th- but immediately we yeah. like those were the ones that sat. But like the Spider-Man wave, there really wasn't a movie figure, so it was all pretty much comic figures. But nothing really. I mean, a few figures broke through, and then a, a, a couple are still hanging around. But the um, the uh, the Black Panther wave, uh, we have I think every Black Bolt that we started with. Yeah. And the Avengers Infinity War, we have probably every Songbird that we started with. Yep. Um. Yeah, it's it's been a weird thing where I as a as a as a comics reader first and foremost and a moviegoer second, I would think that Songbird especially was the character that won the fan vote. So like clearly people care about her as a character and want her as a Marvel legend. Just not people here in Chicago, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, the X Men thing I guess isn't too much of a surprise. I I don't think there's I was gonna say I don't think there's a bum figure in that wave, but they made a gladiator, so there's that. Um, but the rest of the wave is pretty great. Um, it's Mohawk Storm. That new Wolverine is actually an upgrade of the previous ones, so it's worth getting even if you have a bunch of Wolverines. I think the Gladiator figure looks good. Okay, sure. I mean, I'd put him in the Fantastic Four wave, because to me, he'll always be a Fantastic Four villain. Mm-hmm. Too bad they don't have a wave. They just have a series of Walgreens figures. One of the things that the Marvel Legend buyers do is hunt for the best paint job. Sure. You have to with those Hasbro figures, Even people man. that have them on hold need to take their hold ones to the shelf. Sure. And check through all of them. I mean, you've shopped for figures at stores and you've seen like, oh, there's four of these Old Man Logans. Which one is the one where the claws aren't screwed up? And which one is the one where the face looks That's like the eyes work? The Wolverine okay. claws are always going to be screwed they up. They really are. They're never going to be well done. They are. Uh, they've gotten better at the face painting, I think, with especially the movie figures as they've used more um, scanning and digital painting techniques. Uh, like the Paul Rudd figure just looks like Paul Rudd. It's weird. Yeah. It's and, weird. And Wasp looks like Evangeline Lilly. Yeah. Paul Rudd specifically because they, they did the smirk on him. Like, it's just, yeah, it's a pretty great Ant-Man figure. I was looking ahead to the next Deadpool wave. Yeah. Weird wave. It's a weird wave, but they do a couple of things that I really like. Is it the alternate head for one of the Deadpools? Well, not that what the head is, Uh because it's Madcap. Yeah, but... But the way it's packaged Uh is wonderful. The Deadpool figure is turned sideways, Uh and he's kicking the head. Oh, neat. The head is, like, up in the corner with a hat. That's pretty clever. He's he's literally kicking the head like a soccer ball. That's pretty clever. 
I mean, you know, could be for World Cup. I, I like the few times that uh, Hasbro's done that with the Marvel Legends, where they take a character and they give them an alternate head to be a different character. So if you're someone who's like, man, I don't need another chameleon figure. Oh, if I put this head on him, he's J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah. Oh, I do need a J. Jonah Jameson figure. Yes, absolutely. And the Wolverine figure, which is the Laura Kinney Wolverine figure, Yeah. which... I'm very excited for, as is Gina Challenger. Yeah. And I wouldn't have bought my X-23 if I'd known this was coming out. Yeah. Not only does she have mask head and unmasked head, uh-huh. and not only is the unmasked head uh, with the hair in motion, mm-hmm. which is neat. Sure. She's got the foot claws. Yeah, she has her, her foot claws. Which X-23 did not have. No, weird. And weirdly, X-23 is a much smaller figure because, you know, she was younger. Yeah, I suppose so. When but she was in, in the X-Force. They've got the foot claws, and it looks great. Yeah. Very excited for that figure. Well, knowing the way that uh, we get Marvel Legends, I'm sure we'll be getting it next week. Uh, the article I read said pre-orders should go up July 1st. Probably. I mean, for... Uh, I was on Toy Arc. Mm-hmm. Just looking at the Toy Arc. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, we had a, a massively condense... Um, or spread out the graphic novels because of all the space you had to make yesterday. Oh my, yeah, I had to make basically uh, four shelves worth of space in a week where we did not have a lot of extra space. So it was it was very tricky. I, I rearranged the new this week section at least twice because I'm, I wanted things grouped together in certain ways and, and getting that to happen was really difficult. Well, don't worry. I completely rearranged all your hard work. That's fine. I hope you did. If that many figures sold, we'd need to rearrange it. Well, first and foremost, I wanted to give every copy of The Hard Place its own spot. Okay. Because I think Not it's a really shelf. good book. Well, I mean, I don't like all the the negative empty space. Okay. So I didn't. But I think The Hard Place was a really fun, tight six-issue mini. One story, you know, done in one, like plastic was for Image. Mm-hmm. Really, really entertaining, and were, I believe. Were you happy the, with the issue they used for the cover of the trade? Yeah, I mean it's a uh, Brian Stelter's cover. Okay, and it was. But I mean, they just one picked of, one of the yeah. five or six, and it was not the issue one cover. I don't. Think. Yeah, but some of the deeper ones wouldn't make a lot of sense as a cover because they're okay. they're issue specific, and I don't know that I don't know. I thought that was a good representation of okay. what it's about. I'm just always surprised when they don't use an issue one cover. For the, uh, the volume I, one trade. I realized I made a reference to plastic as the same kind of uh, thing. Like a one... one a, a done in one? Yeah. Same writer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just happens to be the same guy. I forget. Doug Wagner? Boy, I shouldn't have said his name. Now I feel like I... Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, I have it wrong, and I don't want to disrespect somebody when I'm, in fact, praising Painted yourself into their a work. bit of a corner there, yeah. Brower. Yeah, well... Got out on a limb... I mean, if we were professionals, we'd stop, I'd look it up, I'd say his name right, and I would edit around it. No, don't, don't do that. We're not professional. I'm just sitting here. We're not stopping. <laughs> yeah, but if I know it, I'll feel inclined to edit it. Well, That's a lie. I'm not going to. I don't have time. Let's see what happens. I'm, I'm very busy. I'm very, very busy with store work this week, That's and true. I have a lot to do, and you're lucky I'm even talking right now. I mean... I should just be ordering. Doug Wagner. Isn't that what I said? Yep. Yeah! Not edited nothing. I got it right. Really Lyle weird. Wagner. Got it. Really weird that when I, I type in a hard place graphic novel to Google, yeah. uh, the immediate thing is, oh, Sergeant Rock, Between Hall and a Hard Place by Brian Azzarello and Joe Kubert. Here's a bunch of other things by Joe Kubert and Sergeant Rock. Oh, here's Amazon stuff. And like the third thing down is Amazon.com, Hard Place number one, ebook. Uh, and then Richard McGuire's here. Okay. And then Hard Place number one from Image Comics. And who wrote that? Doug Wagner. Lyle Wagner, right. Lyle Wagner worked on the uh, Batman 68 TV series. Okay. That's why I keep saying Lyle Wagner. Like Wagon or... Oh, okay. Knowingly getting it wrong. I thought it was clever. Look how much I know about the Batman TV show. It had Batman in it. It was a TV show. It doesn't sound familiar. Mm, Yeah, that's true. I'm not not really sure. Uh, To go along with... Was it last week we were talking about our store pet peeves, of which there are many? Who knows? Maybe. Uh, I had a gentleman today who found Man of Steel number one on our number one section. Sure. Realized he wanted the rest Uh and could not find them. (laughs) First of all, he's like, wait, this is weekly? I'm like, yeah, the first four are out. It's been weekly, yes. uh, You got number one right over here, but the other two and three along with other number ones are on the wall under Superman, right here in the wall, and then around the corner with the new releases is where number four is. Couldn't do it. 
Okay. Couldn't couldn't even come close to finding where the S's were on the shell. Interesting. And Man of Steel is one of the few titles on our regular comic wall that has multiple spaces. Three right now. And some decent heft to those stacks. Yeah, they're not small piles. And so I, I walked over and I pointed where they were and I said, and then if you follow me around the corner, which he didn't, <laughs> and I just stood there with my hand out, yeah. motioning, Hello. waiting for him to come. Oh, I just stayed there till he came. Hello. And then as he came around the corner, I'm like, and there's that, and I tried to walk away. He had a lot of other questions, though. It was a very difficult transaction for the six comics he was buying. Okay. And then even the the entire do you need a bag exchange because we sell bags and boards and people frequently think we're asking do you want bags and boards yeah to which he did want bags and boards but he had said no okay so he had to have another transaction for a dollar 65 for his six bags and boards okay and then he was hunting through his change and hunting and hunting and hunting and could only come up with a dollar 35 so he had to charge the rest not not the rest, the entire thing. Okay, because you, 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 no. you can't charge. You can't charge thirty cents. Yeah, you had to charge the whole dollar sixty-five. I saw that charge, and that explains where it came from. It was a like I said, it's, it was a very difficult transaction for how small it was. But I can assure you, at no point did I let my aggravation show. I was nothing but sunshine and roses. It's very professional. It was a. It was a weird day because I, I was gonna say it was a like it was a good total mm-hmm. for it being kind of boring, <laughs> but there was also a lot of hands-on helping cool. both Gina and I doing it, which was uh, good. Uh, Gina did a lot today with people, uh-huh. and just a, a real weird exchange with a dad and his two kids, and his kids are young, and the daughter is really into New Fifty Two Wonder Woman. Okay, and almost like too young to be reading it. So I tried to push a little more toward Rebirth, uh-huh. but no, she she would not budge. She wanted that new 52. Okay. And then uh, the son was into anything Avengers Infinity related. Okay. Well, we got a few of those. That's true. But it was just that he's... And then the dad's like, is, he, is this going to be okay for him? I'm like, yeah, this is fine for him. Not so sure about later volumes of New 52 Wonder Woman, but that's fine. Mm-hmm. You know what? That's That's fine. I said it twice because I felt like the first one didn't come out. Yeah, it wasn't a whole vocalization like you'd expect. So, we don't necessarily have a specific writing procedure for this podcast. It's just a reflection of... We don't have any writing procedure. <laughs> what is happening. No, I mean, occasionally I'll write words down on a piece of paper. It's true. Sometimes you'll, you'll come prepared with a list of yeah. topics or, or grievances that you need to air. But lately, the comics industry has been giving us plenty of material. It's true, they have. Especially today. And now that I've said it... Next week we'll be scratching our heads, but yeah, today, today especially, yeah, we're, yeah. we have we have several things to discuss, and I feel like we should just go with one of the topics we've been discussing for the last several weeks because it it is it seems that we are as much of a wrestling podcast as we are a GameStop podcast. Uh oh. So GameStop is for sale. Yeah, they uh, they've mentioned that uh, they are. Uh, okay with a buyout. Someone wants to buy them out. They lost seven hundred and five million dollars in twenty seventeen. Like they misplaced it, or they didn't make what they thought they were going to make. They made that much less than the previous year. I see. Okay, that makes more sense. I mean, if they misplaced it, they should be hiring people to look for it. Sure. I mean, that they might be uh, putting out news stories about it specifically to say if someone sees seven hundred and five million dollars in like bags, say GameStop, those are ours. You can't have them. Maybe it's all Bitcoin on a flash drive in a city dump. Uh huh. On a thumb drive. Yeah. Yeah. I GameStop is in a tough place, and, and they have been for a few years. Uh, when the uh, Xbox One launched, they were very much positioning Microsoft was positioning that console as you don't need to go buy games anymore. It's all going to be digital. You'll just have licenses, and you can play them on any box, any Xbox box. And GameStop was not into that concept, and. Uh, fans were kind of not as into that concept, even though like history basically proved Microsoft right on their approach to the Xbox One. So GameStop kind of bought themselves a stay of execution by keeping uh, the Xbox One ecosystem sort of similar to how the, the Xbox 360 was, and Sony with the PlayStation 4 basically saying, like, yeah, it's fine if you want to buy games and, and sell games and all that stuff. We're cool with that. 
but inevitably it's going away um more and more games can be bought digitally and exist digitally and people don't necessarily need to go buy a disc and that's not even counting the the types of games out there that are playable on any platform that you can play on your phone that you can play on your computer you can play on a tablet you can play on a sony console or nintendo console or microsoft console like the the console wars that kind of kept GameStop going for years and years and years uh, is pretty much done. Um, even people who work in, in the games industry on AAA boxed games that you sell in stores are saying, consoles, there's probably one, maybe two more generations of that before they're just streaming boxes. Um, the idea of, of you needing to download game software, the future of the industry seems to be pointed towards essentially like a Netflix model where there's a subscription that they'll have to either a manufacturer slash publisher or just a publisher. Like you would have maybe a Microsoft subscription that, that has games from a bunch of different publishers, or you'd have an electronic arts subscription that would be just their games. And those games would all be, you know, rendered on the the server side instead of on your local box. So you would just have a thing that plugs into your TV or just an app on your TV that that plays those games. But you would still need controllers and stuff. Sure, but anybody could make those. And I don't know that Sony wants to move... For example, I don't know if Sony wants to move from uh, making boxes that cost hundreds of dollars to making a controller that costs 50 bucks that anybody can make the controller. Um, And it's honestly not even Sony that's that's concerned about it because, I mean, companies like Microsoft and Sony are fine being services companies. They're they're positioning a lot of their stuff again kind of away from games and more towards Xbox Live, PlayStation Plus, um, PlayStation Now, uh, Xbox, there's like a Game Pass, I think, or something they call it. Um, So they are prepared for a future where you don't buy games anymore, you just rent a service on a monthly basis, the same way you do with everything else in your life. Would you equate the experience of playing a video game to that of reading a comic? No. We seem to be in an industry that has been able to, thus far, hold off most major technological changes. Sure. How does what you just said for video games apply to comics? I mean, you can get comics that same way. You can get it on a... Subscription um, the, digital basis. Sure. The 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 reason why I think video games and, and why a, a few different people have, have speculated that video games will go the way of things like Spotify, Netflix, YouTube TV, is that no matter how you're doing video games, whether it's a, a game you bought and put into a console, whether it's a game you've bought from the PlayStation Network, or whether it's from a service where you're just streaming game content, you're playing it on your TV. Where it's coming from, for most fans, eventually becomes irrelevant. Um, I've bought games in stores, I've streamed games, I've bought games digitally. The technology for, for streaming games isn't quite there yet. One of the big problems is, is the lag between you're doing something on a controller and a server very far away understanding what you've done and calculating that and conveying it back to you visually. When it's happening on your local console, it's built to be microseconds. But the the time it takes to go back and forth from a server creates enough kind of dissonance between what you're doing and what you're seeing on the screen that certain games can become unplayable. But eventually the technology will get there where they will figure that out. They, they get better at it as time goes on. So technologically, like, how you're playing your game is sort of irrelevant. It's you're playing a game. With comic books, so much of it for the last... 80 years has been about the physical experience of the comic book, the thing in your hand that you sit down and read. And while there's alternatives and there's people who have come to comics through the Comixology store or through web comics, folks that grew up reading books, I don't know that they get rid of that part so easily. Sure. But things like Netflix, like if you're already watching TV on your TV, what does it matter if you're watching Netflix on your TV? Like it's, how is... How is it different? Yeah, it, it's actually better in a lot of ways in your interactivity with it. But with Not a comic if you're book, trying like, to watch Luke Cage. Were you trying to watch Luke Cage? Well, I mean, I successfully watched the first episode of the new season. How but was it? 
mind-numbing though. Really? I was I bad. was so bored. All so the reviews bored. have pointed towards it being uh, better than season one. Oh man, I I don't know what I was expecting, but mm. I I won't be Binging eager it? to continue <laughs> for a while. I'll just sure. be excited for Glow season two. When's that? Next week, a week from right now. Okay, cool. Uh, I didn't I didn't mean to change the topic like that. I I just I found the immediate. We're bringing comics into into the stores to we are looking to sell our stores, which doesn't mean they're going to. It means sure. that they they'll entertain offers. And <clears throat> pardon me, we'll we'll entertain offers. We've always said yeah. that. I well, going back to what you're saying about the the strangeness of them, you know, branching out into comics at the same time they're looking for buyers. I imagine a lot of places that are having trouble making ends meet are flailing about looking for a way to bring more money in. So sure, okay. I read about two stores today that are closing. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. In that. different parts of the country, and one of them is because their rent just went up astronomically, and they they don't want to deal with it. It happens to a lot of retail places. It does, and not it just retail, be. commercial in general. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was specifically a store that was under fire from Comics Gate for telling people that they would not be carrying Jawbreaker, Ugh. and the Comics Gate people are taking it as a victory that they caused this. <laughs> How? Do they own the building? Yeah, right. Uh, so the uh, the owner of the store wanted to let people know this is why sure. I'm going. This is why I'm cho- I'm choosing to close my business. This well, is not. I'm very sorry that that, that happened, and I'm very sorry that uh, in the months leading up to that happening, uh, that store was uh, abused. That's uh, it's unfortunate. They did mention that this May was their best month ever. Cool, but too little, too late kind of thing. Yeah, and I mean if you're kind of struggling and you know you have to look for a new place yeah that's for a lot of stores that can be a a time where you reconsider if you want to move or not and there were well-meaning questions from other retailers like can't you just move where you know what have you looked at but you have to assume that if they're at this point they've exhausted every option it wasn't like oh i never thought of that you know yeah and and i mean we've looked into to having to move a a couple times and it's yeah there's costs that go into that, and if you're having trouble with your day-to-day costs, the additional cost of moving to a location that you may not be in love with in a part of your town that may be harder for people to find you, and knowing that if you're you're doing that, you're committing to, you know, two, three, five years of a lease, you don't maybe want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Even if it's a great place, the, the, the sheer costs involved sure. in, you know, putting it down a down payment... Or a uh, security deposit on a new commercial spot. That's that's a ton of money. Yeah. That's more than just a normal rent for an apartment. Mm-hmm. And that's just the first of, of expenses. But anyway, that's uh, unfortunate. But it so is. excited to see somebody go. But then you get a... Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm using this as a segue to a topic I wasn't going to get to until later. But, but it's working for me. So okay. we'll, we'll just we'll jump in. Then you get a company that is trying to reach out to a larger section of the audience or to grow the audience and to build a new audience. And they do it in a way that there's no easy way to do it without getting a lot of blowback from retailers. And, of course, what I'm talking about is the DC 100-page giants that are going to be exclusively sold as 100 page 499 monthly comics at Walmart. Yeah, they've got four planned to start, a Superman, a Batman, a Justice League and a Teen Titans. And they'll have a new story, a new 12 page story in each one and a variety of reprints. We we got confirmation on the 12 page? Yeah, I read that someplace. Okay. Uh 12 pages. It's it's 12 pages per new chapter or whatever. You so know, the, I was trying to do the math because they they list Three 20 page reprints mm-hmm. per issue, that plus the new story is 72 pages. Well, that, that's some people had, had originally thought that the new content would be 20 pages because, like, if you're doing a new thing and four reprints, that's 80, that's 100 pages. Yeah. But the reprints may be 20 pages, the new content's 12 pages, there will probably be ads. Yeah, there definitely editorial is. Editorial content. There's definitely ads because they showed off a full page comic shop locator service ad. Yeah. Which I think is is uh is good. 
and a thing that they need to do. Yeah. Um, the the bigger news that came out of this isn't necessarily that um, DC is creating uh, packages for Walmart exclusively. It's that the new content that they're doing, starting with issue three for the Batman and Superman ones, uh, feature A-list talent. No offense to the people working on the first uh, two issues. I know Tim Seeley's doing something for one of them. Jerry Palmiotti's doing some stuff. Dan Jurgens is doing something. But with issue three of Superman and Batman, uh, issue three of Batman is the start of a 12-part Brian Michael Bendis, Nick Darrington story. Um, and then Superman issue three starts a uh, Tom King, uh, Andy Kubert uh, Superman story. And those are going to be 12 pages, 12 parts, which someone did the math, and that works out to basically a six-issue trade. Yeah. Each of the first two issues for all four series will have single-issue new stories. Mm -hmm. And then all four of them will have 12-part stories. Uh, Dan Jurgens and I forget who is doing in the Teen Titans one. Okay. The weird thing about the Justice League one is that the the new story is a Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Yeah. Like, they can't just call it Wonder Woman, they have to call it Justice League, well, I but guess, that's because of the reprint stuff they're yeah, putting in. Yeah, I guess the problem is that uh, if you were trying to do a Wonder Woman reprint book monthly that that had three or four reprints, there's only so much content. She only yeah, has the one book right it now. It doesn't have to be, because each of these reprints will have a New Age DC Heroes, like Sideways, Damage, those are part of, of other ones, and they're not linked by... Yeah, it's, it's interesting that Justice League and Teen Titans got the nod. That's uh, when you could have done Wonder Woman and maybe Flash or somebody. But no, yeah. So I, maybe some of those will, you know, after a year or 15 months or whatever, they'll re-examine and decide. Sure. Maybe some of those don't make it and maybe some get replaced or whatever. And just because they're doing this doesn't mean it's going to work. Sure. It's a trial. Um, as you can imagine, and I'm sure they could imagine, the retail community is up in arms. Well, the messaging on this was not great. Uh, Dan DiDio specifically said that... the. the the comics retailers were supposed to find out first. They didn't. So the reporting was very much, hey, DC's doing these exclusive books for Walmart with, again, with brand new A-list 12-part stories that your stores will not have access to. Yeah, but first by a few hours, not like a right, week or but, two. But, I mean, the internet works the way it works. Yeah. That news yeah. goes out and you got a few hours of people being furious about it as a very quick aside on a Transformers board there was the BotCon trademark, which was the, the Fun Publications run official Transformers convention. The trademark had been, someone had posted that the trademark had been renewed by Hasbro. So fans were like, oh my god, Hasbro's going to be doing BotCon. BotCon's coming back. An official Transformers convention is coming back, run by Hasbro. It's going to be great. And then a couple hours later, someone went, hey, I read page two of that thing that you linked to. It's Fun Publications just renewing their trademark. That Nothing's happening with it. It's just them saying, hey, that thing we owned, we still own that trademark. They, they can't run any conventions. Hasbro took it away from them, but they can still own the BotCon trademark. So for two hours, you had ten pages of posts of people saying, oh my god, I'm so excited, this is so great! And then like, no, no, no. So yeah, I am not surprised that comics retailers, in a few hours, got real angry about this. Because it was not pitched to them in the best way possible. Uh, speaking of BotCon, I admire your professionalism and the fact that you are actually here right now mm -hmm. recording this with me and not at JoeCon. Oh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Final JoeCon. Because I figured, you know, Joe, Transformers, same thing, I, right? I did go to a JoeCon that was in Springfield, Illinois. I took the train down there one year because it was a straight shot. And um, just to see if they would have some robot toys because in years past they've had robot toys. They did not really have any robot toys, or at least they didn't have anything I was looking for. So I, I basically looked around and kind of saw how the other half lived and was sorry for them. And then <laughs> got Jimmy John's and went back on my train. <laughs> Jimmy John's of all the things in Springfield? So it, Springfield is like small town America. It was like a Saturday, maybe? Nothing was open. And it's like, okay. it's, it's Springfield. It's kind of not like, where the convention was was not like... The metropolitan area. Well, it was very I mean, to like... be fair, you didn't have a car, but one's one of my summer jobs was mm -hmm. uh, delivering printing supplies to different places, 
drivable, and I frequently had to go to Springfield. And right off of I-55, when you're turning to Springfield, there which, was a... Which I was not by. <laughs> there was a double lane Hardee's drive through Oh, that would have been great. Yeah, yeah. no, I, my, my stuff was basically, like, what is within, like, five blocks of the convention center and okay. a bus station. Because it's yes. a train to a bus, and then a bus back to a train, and the train into Chicago. Every Springfield trip always meant, I'm stopping at Hardee's, because we didn't oh have God, one here. Oh, my God, Hardee's so great. Best breakfast. Best fast food breakfast. <laughs> and uh, it, it wasn't... Uh, this was in the 80s. Um, so getting back to the D.C. Walmart thing, um, Dan DiDio had, had, you had said, done a Facebook Live thing where it was more kind of answering questions and, and assuaging retailer fears. Pointing On a at, variety of topics, yeah. not just... But this needed to be addressed. Fears. Yeah. Um, again, because the messaging was not for comics retailers, which means a lot of comic retailer questions had no answers for them at that point. And for example, how many pages? Yeah, well, one of the main things was... Of the new story. Was Obviously for this new one. content... How are we going to get it? Like, if this magazine, this this comic book thing that you're putting together for Walmart is Walmart exclusive, how do we get this stuff? And I had thought, just thinking it through, like, oh, this is going to be like the Marvel Comicsology first comics, where they release them digitally, and then eventually they release a collection of them, like they did for Black Panther, Long Live the King, like they'll definitely do for Cloak and Dagger. Yeah. It just takes a while. <laughs> we had a club member ask to subscribe to Cloak and Dagger this morning. Yeah. Can you pull with the first issue and add the rest? Can't do it. No. That is not a thing that is that exists in a physical form. Digital first. Um, so I was disappointed that I knew that because of the timing of it that you would respond, mm-hmm. but I really wanted to do that one. Um, so, yeah, the um, the Brian Bendis Batman story and the Tom King Superman story will be collected. They will come out in a physical format um, if you want to wait for it, which, I mean, I, I'd rather wait for it, kind of, than, than pay five dollars a month for 12 hey, pages of story all right so let me just say this right now uh-huh. i am not bothered by this no entire thing for a lot of reasons one of the reasons <laughs> is because it is smaller than your average comic it is in a reprint anthology we would not have a significant sell-through rate no it's not for we us. Would, yeah, I mean, yeah. even even if it was, it's, it's not for comic even shops. if it was done <laughs> exclusively for comic shops. No, I mean the the whole format, the whole idea of it. It's not for comic shops. No, I know, but even my point is, even if it was, it wouldn't sell that great for us. This would be a, a bad seller. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I. It's the way a comic shop would look at it is, it's five dollars for twelve pages of new content. Who who am I going to sell it to? Who is a hardcore enough fan? that they're going to say for a year, I'm going to pay $5 a month to get the next and some of the story, rather than wait a year, in two months maybe, and just get the you know, $15 to $20 collection. Yeah. Um, and then, the next part, mm-hmm. they already have more stores carrying these books than if every single diamond account carried it. Sure. Uh, they're, they're putting in 3,000 stores. There's not 3,000 comic shops. No. And just looking back at, at my history of reading comics, and, and most people my age and older who read comics still, we almost all started on newsstands. Yeah. I, I, That's wh- why we all have nostalgia for spinner yeah. racks. Yeah, the hope of... I th- what should be the hope of a lot of comic shops for this program is that it does work. That some kid or adult buys this $5 collection at Walmart gets excited about these things because Walmart cannot fill that void in them. Right. Walmart cannot be the enthusiast comic shop. They're going to have a comic shop locator service ad in there. And honestly, they'll probably have ads for stuff like Comixology and DCBS or Midtown or whoever online. And they're going to want to engage with comics more and they'll have that avenue to do it. But that that first spark has to happen. And for a lot of people, they go to Walmart, they don't know where a comic shop is. So maybe they see this thing in Walmart and it, it, it ignites a love for comics in them. So I'm totally fine with DC as a publisher reaching out to other outlets to, to get comics going because I know that's how it happened for me. You want to know what's ironic about that? I don't know where a Walmart is. Yeah, that was something that I, I, a few people had pointed out online is that one of the things about this that's interesting is that 
while again the hope is that you know someone finds a Batman 100 page giant reads it and goes oh my god I gotta get more Batman comics I can't get them at Walmart where's a comic shop where I can go get more Batman comics a lot a lot of the more rural areas that have Walmarts don't have comic shops nearby and a lot of the urban areas that have a lot of comic shops don't have a Walmart now let me clarify that I do know where there are Walmarts in the suburbs yeah Suburbs I, have I a good cross section of both of those things. They have comic shops and they have Walmarts. And I do know where there's kind of a Walmart in the city. Yeah, it's around of. the corner from Century Landmark. Yeah, but it's not. It's really not. A, a it's not a. It's like a little. Uh, it's like there's a Target around the corner from uh, River East, but it's more of like a grocery store, soft goods. Yeah, kind of I want to say that this was like a world a world market. That yeah. Walmart took over, so it's not a full Walmart. No, it doesn't have the space to be a full Walmart. Yeah, it's more like a a, a Walmart bodega. Yeah, that's a the Walmart th- kiosk. That's the thing about Walmarts is that they kind of thrive on you know gigantic warehouse structures, and those are prohibitively expensive in the city if you can even get your your alderman to sign off on it. So this is the only Walmart I know of, even remotely close to us, and I wouldn't be able to say for sure that they'd be carrying these books because of how small yeah. of a they might not store have it actually is. A book or magazine or whatever section where yeah. these are going to go. Mm. Yeah. So there are a lot of retailers saying, like, I don't want to have to tell my customers they have to go to Walmart. You don't have to tell them that. Yeah. It, it's like... Do you honestly think you're going to lose your, like, mainline DC Comics customers to Walmart? I mean... It, it's literally like it's apples the, and oranges. the cloak and dagger story I just said. It's not that, that, actually, I don't know what you had said to this club member, but it's not like we're saying, no, you have to go specifically to this online digital place to get it. I'm sure you just said, we can't get it. Yeah, well, I said it's not a thing. It's a digital first series. It'll be out in print later in the year. Yeah. Which we we had to do the same thing with. Basically that. Marvel promoted Black Panther Long Live the King. We had a few people that week asking us if they could be down for it on their subscriptions, and we had to say it's a digital first series. And when the collection came out, we sold a bunch. So I feel like it all worked out. I mean, Jesus as... Christ, how many copies of Barrier and Private Eye have we sold? Those yeah. are digital first yeah. series. When Private sure. Eye came out, we told More so many today. so many customers, hey, Brian K. Vaughn and Marcos Martin have this new digital copy. Remember Jimmy got mad at he us. He got real mad at us. Because we were... T- we were sending people to buy yeah. digital comics. But we were excited about it as comics fans, as people who like the medium. And we're like, hey, this is a thing I can't sell you, but you can pay whatever you want for it and read it online. And then inevitably it did come out of print collection, and we've sold a ton of it over yeah. the years. It's, and not, it's not like much... that audience that read it digitally, you know, yeah, it, it, no, it, it was not a problem. None of it was a problem. This thing, this Walmart thing, it's not a problem either. Do you think that they will collect the... Palmiati and Sealy stories as well. It'll see print somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, as much as I'm a fan of the people involved in these original content stories, and as much as I would like to read them... Damn it, Mick Darrington, Batman. I, I can wait because, and I don't know this for sure, but there's no way DC is going to have a major character-changing storyline in this. It's not as if this Tom King Superman story is as poignant as... Batman marrying Catwoman. No. Like, there's no... And specifically... It, it can be read at any point. Yeah, the the way they pick these creators for these books, these aren't characters they normally work on, so there's really no risk of there being, like, a cross-pollination of, of storylines between, you know, Batman and this Batman 100-page giant or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that Tom King is not using Rogelzar in any of his... Probably not. Yeah. Um... So it definitely feels like these stories, and if DC's smart about how they're curating editorial content for these 100-page giants, it's something that you don't need to read a lot of other DC comics to understand. Yeah. That if all you can get is this Batman 100-page giant from your local Walmart, they absolutely should not be punishing you for like, oh, did you not read Heroes in Crisis? Did you not read Man of Steel or whatever? Like, none of that should be relevant to to the content that you're getting from this one book which means that when the collection comes out it's probably going to be something that's self-contained that isn't you yeah. know that's not you know an earth one style graphic novel but something that i'm trying to think of something that they've done recently that's even vaguely similar god they really dark prince charming is it weird that i can't think of anything like that that's 
that's set in the DC universe, but also isn't. Oh, that's not set in DC. Yeah, that's the thing. Like most of the stuff they've been doing, that's like an original self-contained graphic novel, is stuff like Wonder Woman Earth One or True Amazon or you know Superman All Star Superman or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, it'll be a self-contained thing. I don't think it's going to be a thing where anyone will need to have caught up with the Batman 100-page giants to understand what's going on in Batman or vice versa. And also, I'm old enough to remember the 100-page giants. I'm glad that they're bringing that kind of a thing back. Sure. I, I don't know if it's going to be any more successful than other times Marvel and DC have tried to create content for that kind of audience. And No, but I appreciate the succeed. effort. Sure. I huh. mean... They got money. I'm glad they're using for, it for that. For everybody who thinks that this is them trying to take business away from us... <laughs> they're really not. It's trying to give it to us. Yeah. It's trying to create comics fans. I'm all for that. Absolutely. Yeah. If 10% of the people who pick up a DC 100-page giant become activated enough as fans that they need to search out an enthusiast shop, that's great. That's a huge win. Whatever money you think your store is losing by not having that $5 comic book to sell, you're going to make it up tenfold. You're going to make it up a hundredfold. That, that could be a customer for life. So I yeah, mean, if, if you do your job right, yeah, you know, it, it goes back to plus, like the kind of customers it's creating are the easiest fans for most stores to serve because they're just dipping their toe in. They have everything in front of them. Well, yeah, and they, uh, they've never read anything. And in theory. They're, they're superhero fans. Yeah, I, I understand it can be difficult for some stores that maybe don't carry much outside of superhero stuff to find a way to serve. A, some of the new readers that are coming in that are excited about different kinds of books and different kinds of publishers. But it should be dead simple for every comic shop in America to be able to serve the person who comes in and says, what Batman comics do you have? That's the simplest right. question in the world. Yep. Although we did have a guy today asking for very obscure things like, you know those robots of the X-Men fight? Did they ever have any comics? They did have one, yes. I mean, kind of. Sean McKeever. It, it's not, I mean, it's, it was vastly different, but, but we, we don't have it anyway. It, yeah, it's out of print. Yeah. Most of that stuff is. That would not. All have that been what tsunami he was stuff for. or whatever it was. Yeah, it was tsunami. That's right. Uh, another DC announcement, and I'm sure we'll still bounce back and forth as okay, okay. The, it arises. But their Black Label line. Yes. The uh, initial offerings will be in what Dan DiDio called "Death of Captain Marvel" size. Uh huh. The traditional Marvel graphic novel. When Marvel had a series of graphic novels back in the yeah. 80s. I, I think most of us would refer to that probably as magazine size. Yeah. Um, or European graphic album. Yeah, it's closer to that. Which, which I thought Dark Prince Charming was supposed to be, but it's kind of its own format. Yeah. It's not quite as square. Again, uh, the retail community is an outrage. Sure. There are stores that have very specific racks that hold comics, and it's built to hold comic books. So anything wider or taller than that is going to be a a bit of a problem for them. And as a, as a lifelong comic fan and as a continued purchaser of graphic novels, given the choice, mm -hmm. if it was up to me, mm -hmm. I would like the format to be the regular comic trim size. Sure. Same However, way. I don't lament when it isn't. If you look at any single bookshelf in this room... Yeah. There's a variety of sizes, sure. all shapes and sizes and heights and depths and widths. Yeah, it's a sort of complaint that I, I don't agree with, but I understand where they're coming from, both readers and retailers. Um, we, I, we've I don't had, feel it has any merit. It's just it, like, for you to say, I can't sell them, my customers won't buy them. Every, look at a bookstore. Thousands of formats. Sure. I, to play devil's advocate, I, again, I, I don't... I don't care a whole lot as, as, a, as a retailer or as a fan, but there have been times that we've had difficulty racking certain kinds of books because of how big they are. That can be a problem. Yes, but this is not that size. No, it's, this is a it's little bigger. bigger. I mean, it's it's as no, big or bigger than something like uh, Highest House or... But, I mean, it, it won't be as big as, like, the saga hardcovers. No, no, certainly not. But it's still, you know... it. It can cause, even for a store like us, it can cause racking issues. And so I, I would understand if stores are irritated by it. And I know for a fact, not a huge number, but some fans have expressed reluctance to pick up stuff that they cannot easily store. Um, it's one thing for an oversized graphic novel. You put that on a bookshelf. Bookshelves are easy to get. But for comic boxes, for filing things, I know there, there are people who were 
you had to be assured you can put your barrier comics in your comic box. They will fit. That was a question somebody said was, well, will they fit in, in comic boxes? No, because they're not comics. No. And that can be... And also, counterpoint, X-Men Grand Design. Yeah, for sure. And But X-Men Grand Design, yeah, that, that and Barrier, I think, do fit in a box. But if it's going to be bigger than that, if it's going to be Death no, and I mean, Marvel size. No, I mean uh, X-Men Grand Design graphic novel, collection. Oh, sure, that thing's massive. It's like treasury size. Yeah. But again, that's a bookshelf thing. Like, yeah. Bookshelf things... It's it's not as much of a problem because bookshelves are not one set size comic but, but boxes. But that's what these are. These are graphic novels. But if they're if they're only well, going to be forty eight pages yeah, or okay. whatever, point point taken. That's tricky. Point taken. Um, one of the things that I thought was poignant was that these sizes are dictated by the creators. Sure. This isn't a publisher saying no. You have to do it. And they won't all be this size. This is just what they're going to start with. Yeah, I think I've said that before when they did the black label announcement was that. This is an option for the creators. They can do them as, as regular or as big as they want to go. One thing that I, I, I'm glad to hear, though, is, and was originally, is that the creators will know going into this what size their book is going to be. One of the things that bugs me on uh, the DC uh, No Trade Dress variant covers yeah, is that I'm looking at a lot of the ones that have been coming out, and I don't think the people who are doing the variant cover... We're told there would not be any trade dress. Because they left room for a logo. Because on almost all of them so far, there's been like a bunch of weird space at the top where like you could have moved the figure up some, but you thought there was going to be a big Nightwing logo or a Batman logo or a Wonder Woman logo, so you didn't. So I'm interested to see what happens in a few months when hopefully when customary. The, the cover artists are like, oh, I have the whole cover to work with. Let me use the whole cover. That'll be interesting to see. Dan did have a whole point about variant covers again and how he is still against them and that when he sees how well they sell, uh-huh. it kind of hurts. Sure, same here. And that just made me realize, like, yeah, you know what? That he He's on our side. Sure. And in a way, like, we're we're kind of trapped in the same way that he is. Like, I would... Part of me is like, I wish we could go back to just selling single covers and not having to worry about you know, 10 covers of this or two covers of that or whatever, or one cover selling faster than another cover. Or did you not stock the variant for this book that you only sell one copy of? But at the same time, we have absolutely made more money the last few months on those titles because we stocked the variant covers. Yeah. I can't imagine what would have happened if we wouldn't have carried every Action Comics cover or, you know, uh, the, the Batman variants and the Deathstroke variants and the Flash variants and all that stuff. Like, it is additive sales. Um, I, I can look at the sales figures and go, it's not just moving from one side to the other. It's additional sales. Yeah. So it, why would I give that money up? I'm not going to sell more, you know, Batman regular covers if I stop stocking the Batman variant cover. So why would I give up the Batman variant cover? And just tell those people I would rather not have their $4. And I think DC is doing it the best out of most people with these logo lists. B covers that are open order. Yeah, there's a usually a few titles each week from DC that will carry both covers on. And when I'm doing the final order cutoffs and I'm looking at the Marvel books, very few of them are things where I'm like, I do want to get a second cover for that book. And weirdly, no one ever asks about those. No. We get DC requests, not every week, but most weeks, beyond, you know, Amazing Spider-Man 800. We haven't really had people saying like, oh, are you going to get both covers for this X-Men comic that's coming out next month or whatever? No one ever asks. If they uh, did, did, maybe we'd start I did have it. a request for the B cover to Weatherman number two. Oh, okay. And it is a thing we had not ordered. The, is it the wraparound cover? Yeah. Oh, I think... I actually think the wraparound's one, a 1 in 25 variant. Is it really? Yeah, there was an image email about it today. Oh, whoops. Is that what they said? They said the wraparound? Yeah. Oh, pff, I don't know if we're going to order 25 copies of that book. Yeah, okay. Not after the how the first one sold. That's right. I told them, yeah, we'll get it for you. Then I have to, I have to reevaluate and get back. Yeah, because we got an email from somebody. Yeah, we did. It's the normal. Here's the in new stuff or image. I just didn't read it. No, no, we got we we. Yeah. It's, a, it's a separate email just for it Weatherman. Was from someone from yeah. Weatherman. Yeah, we've gotten that for the first one as well. Was it Marcos Martin cover? I don't remember. I think it was a a, a Martin, not the letter A, but just a random Martin, maybe one Martin. Yes. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out because I said we could get it. <laughs> sure. I can. I'll get back to him. That that'll be fine. There's always more. To uh, the B cover is Marcos Martin. The uh, yeah. wraparound variant is a one in twenty five incentive variant. Wait, is that the 
Also the B cover? No, that's a, a just announced oh. on, on their Twitter account C cover. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get it. <laughs> no. I feel bad, though. I mean, Nathan Fox is a guy that a couple years ago had a big following. I'll be honest, 25 copies is a lot for most image number twos. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot for most image number ones now. There's a, a high number. Uh, still still pushing Nancy Drew in by night because sure, guys are great. Those, those are really good, but we have to work so much harder to sell so much less of a book that people will immediately fall in love with. Like what? What? I'm saying that it used to be easier to sell really good books. Sure. I'm saying that for all the effort we're putting into these two books, mm-hmm. the returns are not going to be that great. You're right. Well, I uh, Nancy Drew, I think, is... I don't know if it's an ongoing series or limited series. And uh, By Night just got increased from a 5 issue to a 12 issue. I thought it was 12 all along. I told someone today it was 12 issues because that's what I read. I, in yeah, our, in, our, in our system, the initial solicits have it listed as like 1 of 5, huh. 2 of 5, 3 of 12. Well, it's uh, Boom does that a lot. They look at the success of a, ser- of a of many series and say, now it's ongoing. But then it's like Mech Cadet U, which was supposed to be 5 or 6. Yeah. And then, like, it's ongoing. Oh, it ends at 10. So, yeah, it's supposed to be 5. I'm like, no, no, we, we always plan to end at 10. Nah. And that's fine. Did you hear that Dark Horse was in the news today? I don't think so. It is not a specific to us topic, but I'll mention it because it's Pride Weekend here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And during Pride Month, and especially during the Pride Weekends for major cities, a lot of brands tend to promote themselves along those lines. They rainbow up their social media accounts. Yes, that's exactly it. And uh, I have done that for us in the past, but it's nothing we really use. We may have used it when there's been times of support needing to be shown as a nation. Sure. But we don't just randomly change. It's June. Let's let's put a rainbow background in our uh, the C logo. Uh, Dark Horse had done that and offered a, a sale, a digital sale on uh, LGBTQ plus books of theirs, mm-hmm. and a former Dark Horse employee took that opportunity to point out to them how their healthcare I did read about this system yeah. was not LGBTQ plus friendly. Yes, and Dark Horse tried to stay the course with a very straightforward, like, um, but polite answer Uh but that guy was not having it and they took a lot of hits including non-comic press writing stories about it Mm. so they changed their policies good but it was basically they weren't covering hormones um treatments and psychological counseling for transitioning okay when they were doing that for other things i see but there is there's literally a legal loophole where they didn't have to sure because they were self-insured, I guess. I, I didn't uh, yeah, I, I didn't read it too deeply because it doesn't affect I, us. I read about this a week or two ago, and it was... Yeah, it was basically a, they were a certain size business, so they didn't need to do this. But at the same time, it's kind of disingenuous of them to, to claim, you know, that they're LGBTQ plus friendly when, well, the tea part's kind of not having such a great time if they're an employee of Dark Horse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that uh, they were able to change their policies in a way that could uh, make things easier on some of their employees. I long to be a company that somebody that can offer healthcare to employees. <laughs> that would be that would be great. That would be awesome. I had to pay some healthcare bills today, and I thought, oh, those are expensive. Mm-hmm. I don't know what came over me, and I didn't plan to it, but I spent you a did all of the reorders today. ton <laughs> of money. On the store today. I kept seeing these emails come up, and it's like, oh, okay, cool. Hey, look at that. Hey, look at those. And it wasn't hey, some of those. It wasn't meant to be <laughs> everybody. Yeah. But at this point, it's like, what's one more? Sure. And it's stuff we've needed. I was glad to see that the uh, the poster emporium order happened. That's yeah. Weird. They have less stuff than ever before. Yeah, you pick some stuff where I'm like, huh, okay, let's give that a try. Yeah. I mean, literally, that was first of all. I had a struggle to hit our minimum. Sure. But I, I don't know. Did you? I did a yesterday's order. I didn't see the yesterday's one. I didn't uh, know on that one. I don't Attaboy. Did you see Attaboy? I saw Attaboy. Okay. You saw Attaboy. You saw Poster Emporium. Mm-hmm. I some did. Some stuff too. Some kids comics. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, to... We really spread thin on the single issues. We did. We've had some people come through recently that just got armloads of kids single comics. And, uh, and I didn't realize how well those... They don't many of those anymore, so we, we 
can't restock it as easily. I didn't realize how well those Marvel superhero ones are doing. Yeah. I mean, we've nothing. We It's true. We don't stock a lot of them, though. But I mean, like the... I mean, I, I reordered what our initial order numbers were. Sure. You saw. Like, everything was just... Yeah. Onesies and twosies. And then, then I took advantage of a Marvel trade sale yesterday. I saw. Yeah. Which was... Thirty-six dollars worth of trades. I was I was doing um, some of the reorder on Sunday. Was uh, reordering some image graphic novels, and as I was typing them into the system, um, since I wasn't doing them through a point of sale, I was doing them through Diamond's website because yeah. some reorders are easier to do that way. Okay. Um, I noticed there's a little banner saying, "Hey, this is part of a, a special sale." And I went, "Huh, okay." And it was like three or four of the image graphic novels I would have ordered normally as restock were part of the image. Summer Sizzler, Summer Sizzler sale. Yeah. sale. So it was like, okay, sure. And they showed up on the same day. We saved a bunch of money. So it's like, all right, cool. I also ordered the new bookmark. Oh, cool. Even though we weren't necessarily at a point where we needed to order it. But it I, was, I was too excited for it. And I ordered a little bit higher of a quantity than normal. <laughs> Why not order it now when we can afford it? <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, literally, this was a, oh, man, uh, we have a little bit of extra money. I'm going to bleed us dry. Yeah. I, I'm always fine with that like i i like the idea of taking that money when we have a little bit extra because of a couple good weeks and putting it right back into the store yeah and getting product like but I, the, I, the weird thing is how exciting that sure. makes us feel it's great i there are so many things where if we had you know if money grew on trees if i won the lottery if whatever that i would absolutely stock for the store that i can't justify on a limited budget so being able to, to get some of that stuff back in stock, to have a variety of things to showcase in the store, yeah, it feels good. It feels like we're doing our jobs right. Agreed. Yeah. Well, one of the things we do with our job is record a podcast on the Yak Channel Podcast Network in Chicago, where we pontificate and uh, wax poetically sometimes about a pursuit of hobby-turned business with... Um, Graphic images that tell a sequential story through uh, challengers. And that's what this is. A comics business podcast. Where? I already said it. Okay. I already said it. You heard me. You you knew what it was. We got events coming up. Go to challengers.events to find out what they are because I'm not talking about them. I got, I got August orders to do and it hurts my soul to order comics now. Really? From previews. Well, I mean, why? I mean, the first thing I did was Marvel. Okay. That's why. It's that bad? Yeah. Why? There's 12 new titles. Most of them don't deserve to be, deserve to be titles. Uh-huh. There's a bunch of weekly miniseries. Sure. I, if, if it makes you feel any better, and I, I can't... Let's see. I can't imagine it will, but I do FOCs on those. I know. So, I mean... Doesn't it hurt you, too? Not really. Huh. The thing that hurts me on, on having to do FOCs is all of the stupid math I have to do on the deep Ugh. discount structures Ugh. to figure out if they're viable or not. Because it's all, if you order 200%, 150%, 100% this book from two months ago, and those you do 200% of what you ordered on that for this new book that's coming out, you'll save an additional 10% off of what you're ordering. So it's a lot of like, all right, so if I order what I wanted to order for this book in September... At what we would normally pay for it wholesale, that's this amount of money. But if I order 200% of the book from two months ago for this new book at this lower discount, or at this higher discount, and I'm paying less wholesale per unit, which of those two numbers is better? And if the second number where I'm ordering more copies is higher but not too high, then it's worth doing. It's never really going to be lower. It's always going to be... You know, if it's 20 bucks more to get 50 more copies, I'll do it. I'll tell you, my favorite one recently was for Fantastic Four number one. Mm -hmm. To qualify for discounts or variant covers, mm -hmm. you need to do 300% of the current Jason Aaron, Ed McGinnis, Avengers number three that just came out. Mm -hmm. What is the correlation of that at all? It's the biggest book they could pick. That's but just the biggest book. When has Fantastic Four outsold Avengers? Yeah. By three hundred percent. Yeah. And so, like, there was an immediate backlash and retailers like, We'll never be able to do this and Marvel said, You know what? Fine. We heard you, we're making it easier. New lower discounts. Two hundred and seventy five percent. 
Yep, there you go. That means if you ordered 100 copies of Avengers number 3, you have to order 275 copies of Fantastic Four number 1. No. But don't worry, they're doing delayed billing on half of your order for if you have net terms. No. Yeah, it's terrible. This is, like, how is it... That's not even... Like, you don't have to waste any time thinking about that. The answer is outright no. Yeah, there's no way. Especially not because it's, like, 5 or $6 for the first issue. It's yeah. not cheap. Uh, that's another DC thing. Because they're bringing their books um, to three ninety nine across the board, mm-hmm. what are they doing to compensate for that a little bit? They're going back to 22 pages of story. Oh, okay. They're adding two pages, and they're changing the paper quality mm-hmm. so it's not gloss. Interesting. Which... I think is great. I've been for matte paper for years. Sure. Because fluorescent lighting in the store makes comics have glare. It really does. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I'm not used to companies doing that, um, actually trying to make the value of their book better when they have to raise prices instead of just going, I don't know, they cost more now. Right. Which is how other companies, DC size, tend to approach things. With shitty paper stock. Yeah. Not across the board. No, it's true. But... Man, that Deadpool, I gotta tell you. Yeah, that was a, a, some terrible, terrible cover stock for a book that cost $5. That, uh, oof. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that Order Pack is so grueling for you. It's just that you look at books that you love and you can't sell mm-hmm. because you have to order Cosmic Ghost Rider or... I don't know that that is, is a, a correlation, though. I mean, there's things that aren't selling, but it's not not selling because of new Marvel comics that look, I don't know, like something I don't care about. You know, it's not like uh, By Night isn't selling because New Mutants Dead Souls exists. Well, that's not selling. Not not to, not to pick one but book to by, target. By Night sells better than that. So it's, I don't think it's it's a huge problem. I, I think it's just a matter of, there's definitely books that, that I look at and I go, I don't know why that exists, but I tend to, to blow past them. When I'm doing final order cutoffs, I don't, you know, wring my hands about it. I just look at it and go, all right, well, what's this this number? I don't care about this book, so this number is what I'm going to put. I use my 100-sided die for most of That's a lie. I don't have one 100-sided die. And also... You have two 10-sided I, I wouldn't use uh, 100 as the highest level for... Eight-sided Facebook. die. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, FF number one. Oof. Six. We're getting six copies. What would you? I mean, th- you don't have to say if you don't want to. But what, what do you? What do you think you're going to order for FF number one? Oh, I already I, did. I don't even I remember what it. the subscriber count is. Uh, it's very low. Is it really? Yeah. Because I feel like more people have been asking about it. It's like it. twelve. Jeez, really? Yeah. I guess that's what happens. We don't have a book to match it to. What would be your number? Um, I, based on kind of the way that I think fans are going to take it and and the excitement that might be there. Probably like 100. Okay, well, it's, that's much higher than mine. Yeah, I feel like it is. Yep. What were you going to do, 50? 80. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I have high hopes for the book. I thought Tony Stark Iron Man was really good. Yeah, for sure. And Dan Slott seems way more excited about FF than Iron Man, and his Iron Man is, is uh, quite the enjoyable ride. Yeah, I'm really curious if FF's going to be the kind of thing where people are going to jump back on it. Uh, Marvel 2-in-1 has performed way better than I thought it was going to at this point in its run. I did not think that book had six issues in it and we keep selling out of it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe there's a fan base out there that has been underserved by Fantastic Four comics And it's definitely not a Chip Zdarsky thing because Peter Parker doesn't sell to that level. It sells around that level. Yeah, I mean, it sells quite. okay, but not what we were hoping for. No, for sure. Did you see he's drawn one? Yeah. That's neat. Yep. I'm excited for that. That's neat. I like Chip Zdarsky. On everything but his creator own book. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I like the art on that book. I, I stopped reading Sex Criminals. I know, me too. Say. Me too. Remember how many first looks and digital previews and stuff we used to do? Jeez, yeah. Now I don't at all. Me neither. And, and I don't, <laughs> feel, I don't feel bad. bad. I, I do. I, I don't, well, no, I, what, what, I didn't finish. I, said, oh. I, I don't feel bad about starting a new image series and then just saying, I read the first one, I'm good. Oh, it, oh man, I do that for so many comic books. I, all I need to do is read the first issue to know who am I pitching this to and how am I pitching it. Yeah. That's it. That's what I need to know to do my and job. to be able to answer a question if anybody has it. I don't need to keep reading a book I don't care about. Sure. But there's enough new stuff coming out that I have to keep up with that the new stuff plus the few books each week that I actually enjoy reading for myself is more than enough stuff to read each week. More than enough. That's what I get for playing with that shelf the whole time we're talking. I have nothing but dust on my vest. 
How dare I? Well, that's it. I've ruined this vest. It's time time for me to go. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago. 773-278-0155. Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. Like Challengers Comics on Facebook. Follow at Challengers on Twitter. And help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.